So ironically enough, my last video turned out to be a little controversial, getting a lot more traction than I could have expected, and thus reaching a lot of people who don't know that I actually quite like Elden Ring. At the end of it, I said I was considering doing a video of the opposite concept if there was interest. And not only was there interest, there were demands that I make it to prove that I'm not nostalgia blind. So here we are. However, there's a twist this time. I'm only going to be discussing things that the rest of the games didn't already improve upon. For example, I could bring up how Crimson Flasks is a better mechanic than Healing Grass and Demon Souls, but that's something that Dark Souls 1 has already improved upon, so I can't discuss it. As you can probably guess, this will naturally make it harder the older the game, but I'm actually pretty happy with what I came up with. If you would like to make your own list in the comments, you can certainly play along, but by no means are you required to. Once again, I made a post asking folks what they thought Elden Ring did better than the other games, this time on YouTube community posts, so I'll be discussing some of the ideas there too. Primarily at the end, because they don't have the restrictions of my little game. Let's start backwards in this one. For Dark Souls 3, one I think is universally agreed on, the Ash of War system. By this, I primarily mean the way they work. Being able to customize the special moves of weapons was a brilliant feature that helps play on the RPG aspects of these games, which definitely felt like they were being abandoned as time goes on. Speaking of special moves, the fact that they feel special and tended to be very effective is also a plus, generally speaking. Another thing that seemed to be happening as the games went on is that a lot of things were just way too underpowered, making a lot of things feel either unviable or just not worth the side investment. Soul Stream is the first thing that comes to mind, for instance, but it definitely extends to a lot of weapon arts. This is not to say that Ashes of War aren't completely busted at times. Even after a ton of the balance patches we have received, some of them still completely outclass most of the other options. But credit where it's due, FromSoft really tried to balance things in Elden Ring much better than Dark Souls 3 in my opinion. For example, whenever they nerfed the Rivers of Blood's Corpse Piler, they didn't go for the easy option of just nerfing all the damage and bleed buildup entirely. They decided the bulk of the debuff to damage and bleed buildup should be made to the blood spray part of the hitbox and only slightly nerfed it when you're right in front of the target. Whether it's enough or not, or whether it was too much, that'll be endlessly debated, but in my opinion that was the perfect way to approach it at the very least. Even if some of the Ashes of War are still a tad too strong, to some extent, I prefer this over making a weapon kinda useless from how underpowered it feels. My only major complaint that comes to mind is that I wish any weapon that can't have its Ashes of War changed had a unique one, or at least one that you can't already equip on any other weapon. Whenever you find a somber weapon and it just has a basic ass Ash of War, it's definitely a little disappointing. The Co-op Based PvP If you're unaware, Bloodborne was the first game in the series that effectively forced invasions to always be 2v1s at the very least, with only two areas as the exception where you can be invaded solo. But the main issue was that they allowed you to kill an enemy that summoned the invaders. And if you know where they are, you can certainly kill it before it can pick up any invaders. Yes, yes I know, you hate invaders so this is a pro to you. But let's just keep it to how things are intended to work. FromSoft wouldn't allow invasions at all if they wanted you to be able to effectively negate the mechanic altogether. As a result of this enemy mechanic, the activity of invasions of Bloodborne has always been spotty, especially because it's also location based, meaning that if you want to invade someone, you have to be relatively close to them in your own world as well. This is cool in theory, it can allow you to spawn in an ambushing spot if you wish, but I think it ultimately did more harm than good. So of course, Elden Ring is also a game that only allows invading to be against someone who already has a summon, but neither of the problems I mentioned are an issue in this game. That, along with it obviously having sold more copies, means that Elden Ring is just vastly more active. And since they added the invading near and far options in a patch, it's been better than ever for activity. I do want to address that some folks don't like that you're forced to fight 2v1s all the time, so obviously a good majority of them might say these games have worse PvP, but in terms of how they handle it as a 2v1 minimum scenario, Elden Ring objectively does it better. I do want to make it clear that I'm not one of those folks. Bloodborne and Elden Ring are my two favorite games to invade in actually, and anything that makes it harder for invaders to troll or grief is good in my opinion. The sorceries. I almost dared and put all spell types in Dark Souls 2 in here, because this is the game where they started to get nerfed to the ground, but things like hexes and pyromancies still seem good enough if memory serves. For full context, I believe all casting types in Dark Souls 2 used to be strong at launch, but they received the nerf in patches and the scholar version to different degrees, and since that's what 99% of players will experience today, I'll be judging the current state of it. I have done a hex dedicated playthrough, a pyro playthrough, and a sorcery playthrough in the past, and that last one is the one that was most tedious to get through. Don't get me wrong, the variety of spells is great, but I never really felt my build was strong enough no matter how much I put into the correct stats, and needed too many alternate things to buff myself. And as I mentioned in the Dark Souls 3 segment, this problem sort of lasted all the way to that game, 
so I think it's a fair criticism against Dark Souls 2 with the rules I'm going by. I'm sure this needs little explanation in Elden Ring. This game was a real breath of fresh air after having many years where the spell system was either too limited like in Bloodborne or just outright disappointingly weak in Dark Souls 3. Spells are really strong in Demons and Dark Souls 1, but they were also fairly limited, most of them just being the same spell except different size, strength, speed, and range. Once again, perhaps these are too strong as well, it's certainly a trend with Elden Ring, but it's certainly much more understandable than Ashes of War, as spells require much more equipment and stat investments than simply being able to wield a weapon and upgrading it. This one was the most difficult to me, and no not because it's perfect or I'm nostalgia blind, I think the main reason is because the later games draw so much from this game in particular that most aspects of it have already been toyed with to some degree before Elden Ring, making it hard with the rules of the game I'm playing. But here's what I settled on. Nothing. Let's move on. Okay, that's a joke, obviously. <laughs> I know this one will sound weird at first, so bear with me, but it's the way Elden Ring reuses the Asylum Demon concept. I'm sure you've heard this before, but the Urtrier and Putrid avatars heavily reuse the skeleton and some of the moveset of the Asylum Demon in Dark Souls 1. Now I know that irked a lot of people, this isn't even the first time it's been reused, but here's why I think the way they reuse it is very clever. In Dark Souls 1, the Asylum Demon itself was actually reused twice, with only very minor additions to differentiate them from the tutorial boss and making them harder. A lot of people hate this, or are lukewarm to it at the very least, including myself. The Fire Sage Demon is especially offensive due to the fact that it's already part of a chain of bosses that are way too close together, and not very good generally. If you played Dark Souls 1, I hope I don't need to explain this much more, it's definitely one of the weakest parts of the game in general. But now to justify the archery avatars. The fact that they did reuse the Asylum Demon stuff doesn't particularly bother me. It's a huge game, obviously there's only so many fresh things they can create without extending the development time by a considerable amount. What I do really like is how they decide to use them. Most of the time when you see an archery or putrid avatar, especially when they're at the minor archeries, you can expect that it'll drop a crystal tier and that creates a pretty good expectation of what the reward is for this particular boss. It helps that most of the crystal tiers you get from them tend to at least have some utility, even if niche at times, but that's why they're easily replaceable as well. I want to say, even if you fought the Asylum Demon in Co. Plenty, this boss can still be a bit challenging anyway, it has enough moves to really throw you off, and some super fresh ones that may take a bit to figure out as well. But once you do, you know you can take most down and get a decent reward afterwards. And that's not to mention that occasionally they'll throw a curveball as well like the duplicating one in the mountaintops. The Storm Ruler variant. This one hurts my soul because I actually prefer Storm King myself. It's one of my favorite bosses in the series. But I have to admit that Rykard's version of the Storm Ruler is arguably done better, and of course I'll get into why. I don't have a problem with the Storm King fight or how it plays out. The fact that the Storm King and the Manta Rays are literally unreachable unless you already have a good ranged option is a good way to let you know something is off, and there's something in the room that you'll need. By this point in the game, you may have also noticed that the Archdemons of Demon Souls tend to be taboo bosses in one way or another, so odds are that's another red flag going off in your head. And of course there's the death note that hints at it inside the boss room. If I were designing this boss, I maybe would have put the Storm Ruler closer to the boss fog, but maybe not next to it necessarily. But I do like where it's ultimately placed. Once you find it, all you have to do is swing once, and as long as you're paying attention to what happened and try it on an enemy, you should have all the puzzle pieces that you need. And this is all before you even get the actual boss. You'll only encounter the small mana race first for you to understand the concept before the big threat begins. I know this doesn't always go so smoothly, and not everyone thinks this way, but it's about as sound as you can make it for a puzzle type boss. And after encountering the Adjudicator, if you're a melee only build, that should teach you that there's always a way. Of course, the reason that Rykard requires a special weapon is not due to the inability to reach it. It's only due to you doing significantly less damage than normal which is an extremely dangerous territory to walk on. I've seen people try to beat Asylum Demon with a broken straight sword in Dark Souls just because, you know, game hard, and not realizing that it's still not going to have you grind a boss for 30 minutes, even if it is a challenging game. Again, it's hard to have a solution that everyone will get with how complicated computer games are these days, but doing it this way is far more likely to receive that kind of response than Storm King. However, to bypass this somewhat, they do give you the Serpent Hunter right up front, and that, along with the Phantom and the Volcano Manor, should hopefully make you at least consider trying out the weapon before the fight starts properly. Reminder that the Serpent is asleep until you get close, giving you a chance to try it without being attacked. Now despite the potential flaw, the reason I did want to make this argument was because of the expanded moveset of the Serpent Hunter. The Storm Ruler, even though any attack you can do causes the Wind Strike, it's still only a downward swing, so it's not very dynamic, where the Serpent Hunter is. 
The Serpent Hunter is basically a normal weapon moveset just with a really blown up hitbox, making a fight with a Serpent and Rykard almost feel like a Gundam fight or something. It's certainly really interesting, and this hopefully resulted in more people being into it. The fight has a few things that are questionable or annoying, but I won't necessarily review the whole fight for this video. I'm more so talking about how the weapon works in particular. If you're wondering why I included this, despite my rules, given that Yorm exists, that's because Yorm sucks. Sorry, I just think it completely ruined the Storm Ruler, and the Serpent Hunter was a better implementation of it. I hope the way I described the issues with having the boss just take less damage foreshadowed why I don't think this was done well, on top of it being in the back of the boss room and having him aggro the whole time. But the final nail for me is just how the weapon requires you to do the weapon art, when you can get through the entire rest of the game without ever performing one, and is a needlessly complicated, multi-step process to get the weapon fully charged. The fact that it's also a 5 hit kill is also just boring to me, I don't know. Anyway, here's live footage of my mind being read by both of these comments. I had just decided on these entries and then these comments happened. I'm scared. Okay, so here's a few community responses that I thought were good and want to discuss. There's three main ones and they cover things that are just relatively new to Elden Ring, or I couldn't pin to one particular game. The first one is the lack of runbacks, primarily due to the stakes of America. Of course, the series has generally gotten better about not having such insane runbacks, especially if they're a hard runback on an already hard boss. Looking at you, old hero. But the stakes of America are a pretty clever way to do it instead of just putting graces in front of boss fogs. I do want to say that because I'm a sucker for some really good level design, I'm more partial to when a game simply opens a shortcut that leads more directly to a boss, but I'll be damned if Stakes of America aren't very close to being just as good. The reason I like this idea a lot is because there's a very small drawback to using Stakes instead of Graces. You really have to commit to your current setup if you're going to use them. If you're a spellcaster character that really wants to change out their spells, you can't do it at the Stake of America, so you will have to go back to the Grace and switch it out there, then do the run back to the boss gate. The same goes for physic mixes, and I suppose if you want to experiment with something new, like a currently unupgraded weapon. If you're wondering why I'm so enamored with them, and I'm opposed to putting graces in front of all false bog, false bog? Wow. And I'm opposed to just putting graces in front of all boss fogs, it's because I think once in a while, it's okay for there to be a little bit of run back to a boss. There's certainly some in the earlier games that were relatively harmless, but I'm also by no means implying it should be for those bosses. You know, the millennia of their respective games. So I think Stakes America are a very good compromise. Just throwing this out there as another good compromise, the Dream Gate in Hollow Knight, which is simply a beacon you could put down anywhere that allows you to teleport there. It only requires that you think to put it down really, and a negligible consumable cost. But I still find it more creative than just a bench in front of a boss, which is almost unheard of in that game. The second major point is summoning pools, but only after that patch that actually made them more useful than just another summoning sign. I haven't played with them too much, so if I get anything wrong, I apologize. But I believe how they work is that if you put down a summoning pull sign and click on the both near and far option, it'll send your sign to not only the pool that you're near, but also pools all over. From what I read online, it seems that there's no limit on how far your sign will go, as long as you've activated the summoning pool for that area. So say if you're in Limgrave, you can get summoned all the way into the mountaintops as long as you've been there and activated a pool there that you would like to help for. The same goes for duelist signs, but that's probably a far more niche use. But I mean, imagine I don't need to elaborate much more on this one. I'm sure you can see why that'd just be an active improvement to the random multiplayer activity. The last reply I want to discuss is on the build variety of Elden Ring. As I ramble here, I'll be showing all the PvP builds I've made for this game. Should hopefully show how much variety there is. And I mean, yeah, as we discussed briefly in the Dark Souls 2 segment, the variety in sorceries alone, along with feeling appropriately powerful, can lend itself to all sorts of themed builds and runs in this game. But that also extends to the incantations, and of course the weapons, which are nearly all viable in their own way, at least at some rune levels. Perhaps some fall off as you get through the game, but if you're making a low level character, I imagine there's some that shine better due to the lower stat requirement and such. I'm confident in saying that this game outright has the most build variety potential out of all the games, and I cannot wait to improve some of the builds or create entirely new ones with the things they'll introduce in a DLC. I'm actually getting giddy just thinking about that. And that is the video. Before we go, I do briefly want to address the last video a little bit. As I mentioned in the beginning, it did get a very mixed response from a lot of new people that came into the video. And I just want to say, I get it. The nature of the title of the video can give off the wrong impression. I know this game did get a lot of heat from a lot of content creators, especially when it first came out and people finished it. Hence me calling the game controversial at the beginning of that video. And I understand a lot of people are tired of that. 
Imagine, especially if it's your first Soulsborne game, you might just be thinking we're out of our minds because it's a fantastic game. And it is. So with all that in mind, I understand why at face value the video might just seem like it's adding to that. But I also hope that if you actually watch the video, you could kind of see that that's not really the case. Because I still give Elden Ring a lot of credit where it deserved that I thought. And I never in the video said that it's a bad game or that I hate it or anything. I actually like Elden Ring more than some of the games in the series. If you want me to be specific, more than Dark Souls 2 and 3. And it's only just shy below the other ones for me, to be honest. I did get some comments saying that I was just nitpicking. And yes, that's the idea of the video. I nitpick one thing that I think the other games did better. And of course, in this one's the reverse option. Because that wasn't intended to be a whole critique of the game, just a very particular thing. Now with that in mind, I did get some other comments mentioning how some of the things were maybe too broad and are just things that the particular game did better than the rest of the series, which is also true. And that one is one critique that I will take a lot more, saying that the weapons were done best in Bloodborne. It is a little bit unfair to even include in that video. I did have other ideas for just say Bloodborne, for example, like the Chaz Dungeons. That was one thing that has a kind of direct parallel in the catacombs in Elden Ring. But for one reason or another, I just decided to go against that. And I decided to talk about weapons instead. And to some degree, I think in hindsight, maybe I would do it differently now. So in that in particular, I'm a little torn. I know for sure I cut out Sekiro. I didn't even have that much to say at the end of it. I just said bosses were better in my opinion. And as you saw, I just decided to exclude it from this video entirely. But in that particular regard, where I just cover a very broad thing as opposed to maybe the nitpicks as I should have kept doing, I do apologize for that. It's definitely a live and learn kind of situation. So obviously didn't do it in this video. And I hope overall people are more satisfied with the choices, even if they don't agree. I didn't make this video in particular because I wanted to satisfy those folks I was already planning to. It was just like, oh, this is video did well. And there was comments saying that they want to see it. So, of course, I'm going to do it. And I made this video with a hindsight of how things turned out for the last one, too. And I would certainly hope that just the existence of this video proves otherwise from what a lot of people are thinking. Now, I suspect most of those people won't be watching until now. If you do, I appreciate it. Even if you left a negative comment, like, I don't really mind critiques of the content in itself. What I don't like, personally, is when people bring up things that I already discussed, which either means that they weren't listening or that they didn't watch the video, or maybe they were just ignoring that. Those comments I tend to not even acknowledge, I just don't care to reiterate something I already said. Or just make assumptions about me or what I would think about the game when I never even said anything bad about Elden Ring as a whole. And I do genuinely still think that I give it plenty of credit and a lot of little things here and there. like. Yes, I'm saying they did it better, but I'm not saying it's a better game overall. But again, I understand why the whole atmosphere of the entirety of the whole Soulsborne sphere can set things off in the wrong foot. It's perfectly possible that I'll anger the entire different side of the community, but the prior video already exists, so if they want to check that out, they can watch that instead, I guess. If you're still upset, I don't know what to tell you, dude. <laughs> I'm just making videos for fun. But just before anyone who who was sympathetic to me in those comments because there's some people who were like saw that and were like why <laughs> um overall i was happy with the video and i was definitely very happy that youtube just pushed it out there for context the like to dislike ratio was still like 91 percent it never went below 90 that i ever saw so the overall response was still very positive it's just that you know a lot of the negative comments is, that stick out especially in the first day where it started to blow up and i just was overwhelmed with comments but thankfully youtube actually kind of filtered out a lot of those comments so I actually had fun replying to a lot of the comments that I were like, at the very least, not attacking me personally. I don't mind if you disagree with the points that I had. I liked a lot of the responses a lot of people had and respect all the opinions, even if I don't agree. But either way, there's still a ton of people who enjoyed it, it seemed. So at the very least, didn't take it as seriously as some others. <laughs> but yeah, regardless, hope you enjoyed this video as well. Whether I would ever make anything more like this, like one more thing that Soulsborne did better, and then one more thing that Eldering did better. I don't know, I would have to think about it a lot more because there's certainly less things to talk about as we go on. But for now, there's two projects I really want to work on. They both might take a little while. The first one is obviously the 1.0 series completed video. That one's already been on the books, so it should be my next major video. And then after that, I want to finish my callback series. I need to do Dark Souls, which is Elder Ring callbacks in Dark Souls. All one through three, all in one video probably. But yeah, those are the things on the docket. You can tell I like comparing and contrasting things, seeing where things get their roots and stuff. And if you want to watch any of that, I'll be showing that now. Yeah, regardless of all that though, I do appreciate it for watching this all the way through. If you're still listening, I very much appreciate it. If you did like this video, consider subscribing. I hope to see you again. Bye-bye.